morning to our guests from United States, Jennifer Young and Will Butler. Thank you so much for making it so early in the morning. It really means a lot. And happy evening to all our participants, our truly co-believers to dial in on a Friday evening, skipping movies and dinner plans with your kids to be live to listen to the art of social entrepreneurship. Uh, and this is unlike our first five Reading First webinars, wherein we have been talking about how to get literacy happening in the classroom. How to However, Reading First webinar series number six is going to focus on people who make it possible, people who make change possible at scale. While policymakers are crucial to make these things happen, to prepare our grounds, teachers are important to deliver the learning outcomes directly to children, but there is somebody in between connecting the dots from what matters to taking it to every classroom out there. And we are talking about social entrepreneurs who are making it possible. Today on this webinar, we are going to touch upon three primary things. One, what does literacy mean at a global level? And how does, it, how does India stand in that global roadmap when it comes to literacy as a challenge? B, we are going to look at the role that social entrepreneurs play in solving the global literacy challenge. And C, we are going to also look at how programs like Pearson's Project Literacy Lab, Unreasonable Groups, uh, initiatives enable to help social entrepreneurs scale their ideas much faster than even they can dream. So we would like to begin with our first guest speaker, Jen Jennifer Young. Uh, she leads the social impact initiatives at Pearson Global. And if I were to talk about all that she has done in her career so far, I would need a separate webinar for that. So we would like to begin by having Jen present and introduce to us the social impact initiatives at Pearson. And Stones to Milestones is blessed to be part of that initiative since 2017. Welcome, Jen, and thank you so much for taking out the time. Thanks, Kavish. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to try to share my screen, so bear with me. Uh, let's see. All right, how's that? Super. Perfect. Um, so as uh, Kavish, Kavish said, I, I oversee global social impact programs and partnerships at Pearson. Um, I'm based in San Francisco, California. Um, and as part of my role at Pearson, I lead our, our flagship campaign uh, called Project Literacy, uh, whose sole purpose is to raise awareness of the global literacy challenge um, and also generate investments in innovation and entrepreneurship to really help solve this challenge. Um, I, I also have a, a dual role right now, um, working with our executive team to, to drive an innovation culture within Pearson. And I would say a big part of that strategy is, is really tapping into the entrepreneurial spirit, the agility, and the approach to, to generating new ideas that we see um, flourishing in the entrepreneur ecosystem. Um, for those not familiar with Pearson, we're a, a global education company. Um, we support learning at, at all stages of life. So all the way from pre-K to, to higher education um, and professional learning and, and workplace training. Um, and we do this mainly through um, course content that's digital and print and through assessments and qualifications with um, an increasing focus on personalized learning. Um, and, and there's an enormous opportunity in the field of education. It's a, it's a $5 trillion industry and, and that's 8x, the 8x times the, the software market. Um, but it's also a, an industry that's being transformed very fast, um, which poses both opportunities and challenges um, for, for the sector as a whole. Um, and the opportunity, of course, is that technology is increasing access to education, making it more affordable at the same time, um, which will undoubtedly help us achieve, for Pearson, our long-term growth objective of reaching 200 million learners um, annually by, by 2025. Um, and that's important because we still face big challenges globally with, with almost 600 million children and youth who are out of school or in school and not learning. Um, and then on top of that, 750 million adults who lack basic literacy skills. 
So that, that last number is significant and, and really the focus of this conversation today, which is how we can help close the global literacy gap um, and how we can leverage entrepreneurs to really help solve that, that great challenge. Um, and because Pearson is committed to helping people make progress in their lives through learning and because literacy is kind of that crucial first step uh, in being able to access learning, we decided to make literacy our, our primary social impact focus. So, but to understand why we would invest our resources in that issue, I think it's important to understand just how dire an issue it is. I know these statistics are probably familiar to some of you, but um, these numbers to us are staggering and are what keeps us really laser focused on, on this challenge. Um, you know, the fact that one out of every 10 people on this planet cannot read or write a simple sentence. And, and we know also that that's probably an underestimate. Um, the gender dimension of this challenge is tremendous when you consider that three quarters of the illiterate population globally are women and how that impacts the health and early development of their children, especially when we know that children of parents with low literacy skills have a 72% 70, uh, chance of being at the lowest reading levels themselves. Um, and if, if the human development argument isn't on its own sufficient, we also know that low literacy costs the world um, $1.2 trillion every year. And, you know, we often call it the invisible curse because you, you don't see illiteracy the way you might see poverty, the way you might see homelessness, um, but it's, it's no less urgent. Um, and yet for a decade the, or over a decade, the rate of progress has stalled um, and in some parts of the world has even declined. So, Something, something needs to change. Um, I, I heard someone once compare literacy to a, a keystone species, which means a, a species upon which every other species in the ecosystem depends. And I think the analogy is really um, appropriate for literacy because when our level of literacy improves, so too does our ability to access education, gain employment, improve our earning potential, improve our health, um, and so on. So when we, when we first started uh, developing a framework for a global campaign, which became Project Literacy, we brought in a, a partner, Results for Development, which is a, a DC-based evaluation firm, to, to help us conduct a landscape analysis so we could figure out where the big gaps and where the um, big opportunities were for a campaign like Project Literacy. And what we found was there's, there's a lot of activity around literacy and I'm, I'm sure many, many of you on the webinar today are a part of that really um, vibrant community helping solve this challenge. Um, but we also saw that there, there were big gaps um, and those gaps included focusing on adult literacy, especially mother's literacy, um, parent and family engagement, children with disabilities, and then uh, key areas around how we improve methods for improving literacy and behavior change. So based on, on those insights, we, we developed a theory of change that, that really centered on three major pillars of activity to help fill some of those gaps. Um, and the first is around just raising awareness and, and mobilizing people to take action. Um, you know, we know we need to increase the sense of urgency around this issue. So a big part of the campaign is to get people to sit up and pay attention and get involved. Uh, the second pillar is around advancing best practice. Um, so really building the capacity of the literacy sector through more peer-to-peer -peer learning, more knowledge sharing, um, and also helping facilitate more funding for, for proven programs. Um, and then the third area of activity is really around innovation. So supporting promising solutions through pilot projects, through rapid experimentation, in order to push through again, what's been a, a pretty stubborn plateau in progress globally. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, in a few minutes. So with this theory of change, we launched Project Literacy in 2015 with, with one overarching ambition, which is to make significant and sustainable advances in the fight against illiteracy by 2030, which is aligned with the sustainable development agenda that the UN um, set forward, so that all people have the potential to um, have the chance to fulfill their potential. We, we now have 120 partners in our coalition, um, diverse, a diverse group of partners from UNESCO to the World Bank to World Reader, um, and of course, Stones to Milestones, plus hundreds of, of thousands of individuals who have signed up to join the campaign. And what we've achieved, achieved together as a coalition over the last three and a half years, I, I think is pretty significant. 
Um, over 7 million people um, are benefiting from our innovation partnerships, such as our literacy accelerator with Unreasonable um, and our, our mobile technology pilot project that's supporting families in India, um, both of which I'll talk about. And, and our cause marketing campaigns have achieved a combined reach of 3 billion. We have a, an awesome community of online advocates, hopefully some of you are on the webinar today, of 150,000. Um, and, and we've received 14 awards for the work of the campaign. Um, and I, I, I bring up that point not to toot our own horn, but because with every award we receive, um, the more attention and exposure um, is given to the issue. So innovation and action. So while increasing awareness is, is really important, I would say that innovation and entrepreneurship is where we are really aiming to push the rate of progress into higher gear by scaling faster and, and sharing gains more equitably. Um, to, to, to talk more concretely about how innovation and entrepreneurship are helping solve this challenge, I, I want to talk about two initiatives. The first is called Read to Kids, which is our partnership with World Reader um, and, and an array of local partners in India that, that aims to encourage parents to support their children's early learning through the power of mobile technology. Because we, we know that, that solving for access and equity increasingly requires solutions that are more digital, more replicable, and, and more scalable. So Read to Kids takes World Reader's digital library of, of high quality children's content and makes it available at very low cost to Indian families, especially low income families. Um, and for us, an important outcome is that parents are, feel empowered uh, to become their, their children's first teacher. And, and so why does this matter? Um, the, the evidence is, is pretty clear um, that the more words a child hears at home, the more prepared that that child will be to succeed in, in school and, and beyond. Because um, globally, over 250 million children in low and middle income countries are not meeting their, their developmental milestones. Um, and in India, 52% uh, 50, of children in grade five are reading grade two level text. Um, and a lot of this is because traditional programming um, is not reaching families at scale and parents are also not a part of, of the conversation. So how can we reach families at scale? Um, by using available technology. There are over 5 billion mobile phone connections on the planet and among low income households in developing countries, um, mobile phone ownership is, is rising and rising fast. And this is definitely true of India. Um, and these shifts provide um, opportunities to, again, reach more parents and, and caregivers at scale. So um, we teamed up with World, World, World Reader to build this digital library um, and really to just get parents reading with their children through their mobile phones. Um, and it includes hundreds of, of storybooks in Hindi and English. Um, that we partnered with over 30 local publishers um, to help uh, produce. And the web application is available on both 2, 2G and, and 4G phones. So over the course of one year, we reached over 200,000 um, households in Delhi. And we wouldn't have been able to do that without our with our, our partnerships with um, organizations on the ground. We worked with Kata um, to help us reach neighborhoods. We worked, worked with um, uh, HLFPPT, um, which is a, a, a chain of family health clinics to help us um, use doctors as trusted messengers. Um, and we worked with SARD, uh, which runs programs in schools. Um, and we also ran a behavior change campaign online and through radio and through TV um, to really help us reach as, as many people as possible. Um, and so not only did we learn that we could change people's reading habits through this program, but we also learned that, that digital reading is scalable and affordable. So reading a book for a month, um, reading a book a day for a month on um, the Read to Kids mobile app costs the equivalent of two cups of street chai. Um, and so as we look to how we scale that to more households in Delhi, um, we'll be looking um, to, to scale to about 1 million, 1 million households um, through, through that same program. The, the other major initiative we launched as part of Project Literacy is the Project Literacy Lab, which is one of my favorite programs. Um, and it's enabling companies to move 
uh, faster, fail faster, and to learn by doing. And we think that entrepreneurs have a crucial role to play in, in bringing new solutions, bringing innovation to tackling the global literacy crisis. And there's a lot we can learn from them, their process of iteration, um, how they uh, ideate rapidly, and also their willingness to take some, some pretty brave and, and calculated risks. So um, Project Literacy Lab, it is the world's first accelerator dedicated to supporting entrepreneurs who are developing solutions specifically to tackle literacy uh, or illiteracy. Um, we align these entrepreneurs with resources, with mentorship, um, facilitate access to financing, um, and, and really just give them a, a global network of support to help them um, scale even faster. To date, we've supported, you can see here, um, 29 companies who are operating in more than 120 countries. Um, and they have a combined revenue and financing of over 120 million. Um, and what's awesome is that since the lab launched, we've seen their reach double and their revenue and financing increase by 185%. And I even think that might be, I might be lowballing that number. Um, so who are some of these entrepreneurs? Well, there's no surprise that the ecosystem of entrepreneurs in India has produced three standouts that have come through our program. Um, most of you are familiar with Stones to Milestones, whose uh, vision is to empower every child to find their unique place in the world um, by gifting them with the skill and will to read. I love that mission statement, Kavish. Um, and you're on a mission to create a nation of 10 million readers by 2022, and I have no doubt that you will achieve that ambition. Um, you've already impacted, I think, 33,000 children and transformed over 150 schools. Um, there's also Karate Path, which um, many of you are probably familiar with, language learning curriculum that enables um, language acquisition without teaching words or grammar, so 100% um, uh, experiential. Um, and, and studies have shown that one hour of Karate Path delivers higher language outcomes than 11 hours of conventional study. Um, and finally, there's Guruji, which, which focuses on improving the, the learning experience in schools by, by making teaching fun for teachers. And it also helps personalize their teaching and continuously improve by using um, evidence-based feedback on what is working well. Um, and the app works without the internet um, and has multilingual capabilities and, and also adapts to, to students' moods. Um, and, and they're growing so fast. Guruji has reached over a thousand schools, um, which is double their, their reach when they first entered the lab. And then moving forward, um, our aim is really to leverage this early progress and continue to increase the scale and impact of our, our lab entrepreneurs more quickly. Um, so at, because as Kavish pictured here, along with one of our other entrepreneurs, Michelle, um, literacy matters. And if you're thinking how you might be able to get involved in the campaign, um, I did want to, to um, let you guys know we are getting ready to, to launch our third cause marketing campaign, um, again, to raise awareness of, of illiteracy and, and really inspire people to take action, um, timed with International Literacy Day in September. And this will be our, our first digitally led activation and we're excited to roll it out in partnership with more than 120 organizations and companies in the US, the UK, and India. So um, with the support of a lot of people, including a network of celebrity influencers, we'll, we'll be helping make the connection between literacy and other major global challenges like social mobility, like employment, like gender inequality. Um, and the digital, I'm almost done. The digital experience will invite visitors to explore real world data, um, discover the, the inspirational stories of, of those who have, have overcome challenges to accessing literacy, um, and also find out how our partners are, are creating more literate world. So if you'd like to get involved, please let me know. Um, we'll be providing more details on that experience in the coming weeks. I will stop there. Super. Thank you so much, Jen. And I think from starting with introducing what literacy means at the global level to giving us a very clear cut, actionable to get involved at the International Literacy Day is a good way to kind of take us into actionable steps. One, one thing which Jen, we have been repeatedly hearing uh, before I go to Bill to introduce uh, the accelerated programs. Uh, one thing that we have been repeatedly hearing is solving the literacy challenges, the most challenging thing to do amongst all the other challenges out there in the world. Because it's about, 
if you solve the literacy challenge, you solve a lot many more challenges ahead in time. The question that we are getting is, what are the top two or three challenges you face while solving this problem with the set of entrepreneurs or NGOs that you work with across the world? Specifically, uh, if you can talk from the context of Asia and Africa, what are the key constraints or challenges you face in scaling these ideas? Oh, it's a good, it's a good question, and I'm sure it's um, I'm sure there are some universal challenges, and then there are some context specific challenges. Um, you know, I I can start where I sit, which is the United States, and I think it's it's whenever I, I give this statistic to people, um, certainly my um, people who are live who live in the U.S., they're shocked to learn that there are 32 million adults who um, who lack basic reading and writing skills. Um, if you talk to any, if you talk to any practitioner um, who works on this every day, who's on the ground helping um, helping people improve their literacy, they will say this is a solvable challenge. <laughs> um, we know we know how to improve people's literacy. Um, the problem is um, resources. So how do you how do you marshal the the political will? Um, to to uh, allocate more resources to support this challenge. Um, so a big part of it is 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 financing. Um, and there's you know we there's there's so many um, important causes that um, need attention and need resources. But if you think about literacy as a foundational um, a foundational uh, skill upon which all other um, skills rely, then you can start to um, really, I think, marshal more, more resources towards solving it. Um, so, and, and again, you probably find that lack of resources to tackling this issue as a, as a universal challenge, not just one here in the US. Lovely. Thank you so much, Jen, for that. Uh, we would move on to Will. Uh, Will Butler, he is the director at Unreasonable Group. They run wonderful, I, I think one of the best accelerator programs that we have personally experienced ever in our journey at Stones to Milestones was the Unreasonable Communities Program, Project Literacy Lab in partnership with Pearson. So Will, uh, while you, you please introduce, I want to set a context here. We have been getting several questions that, why are we talking about art of social entrepreneurship from the context of literacy? There are three to four other big areas like health and other issues which are equally a big challenge. So while Jen has mentioned about literacy, uh, would you like to talk about Unreasonable's uh, initiatives as an accelerator uh, across the world? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I'll also, um, you know, I'll kind of lay out a bit of our work and our mission and, you know, the work we're doing at Pearson. Uh, but Kavish, you know, any of these questions, you know, feel free to uh, just uh, to jump in if there's you know, questions around why we focus on literacy or why we may focus on issues such as rolling back the effects of climate change or banking in banks, whatever it might be. So I'm, I'm happy to uh, um, do this as a bit of a Q&A as well. Um, so I, I guess to start off, yeah, I mean, our mission at Unreasonable is to drive resources to and break down barriers for entrepreneurs solving the world's seemingly most intractable problems. Um, you know, and as Jen alluded to, you know, there's about 750 million people plus that we know of. Um, that are functionally illiterate. I mean, that's a huge, huge problem. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's a bit of a, we do this because we're, we're optimists. You know, like businesses and entrepreneurs are, are really set up to solve problems. You know, and, and, a, and a number like 750 million people, um, I, I love what Jen said earlier about, um, you know, kind of these baseline issues. And this is a baseline issue that we need to address. And we're not, we, we haven't, we had that 750 number hasn't, hasn't moved that much. So we, we, we need new ideas and new processes and new entrepreneurs like um, tackling these types of issues. Um, so let me back up just a hair though. The, um, so Unreasonable, let me, uh, the, the concept um, the, or the name came from the Irish playwright, uh, George Bernard Shaw, uh, who said the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all pr progress depends on the, the unreasonable man or, or person. Um, so yeah, you know that's I think that's a perfect, uh, perfect quote for the work in which which we do, um, you know. And, and what you what you're familiar with, Kavish, is you know we run immersive programs similar to the Project Literacy Lab program, um, is is one of our initiatives. 
Um, you know, and that focus on bringing together growth stage entrepreneurs, um, like I say, that are, that are working at these challenges. And then we, we, we create an entire ecosystem approach. Um, so we bring in world-class mentors and thought leaders. Um, guys like, if, if anyone's on the line, check out Tom Chi, uh, any of his work. Uh, Tom is a, a master at prototyping and prototype thinking. Kavish is just smiling. I can see him like thinking about working with Tom in the program. Um, so Tom is one of the, the founder of Google X or Google Special Projects Edition. He personally invented the um, Google Glass. His, the team below him invented uh, the self-driving car concept that Google has continued to work on. Um, so he'll introduce methodologies. Prototyping is a big one, but essentially how do you convert unknowns in your business to knowns as quickly as possible? Um, so you can prototype everything from, you know, market strategy to, to raising capital to um, a new product or service that you're looking to launch within, within your organization. Um, and so we bring together those elements as well as we have an investment fund associated with the work. Um, Stones to Milestones is actually one of our, um, you know, we've, in, we've invested in the Stones, which, you know, we're incredibly proud about that as well um, and then we have a you know an entire like global network of other entrepreneurs um, you know can because this, this is kind of a lonely journey at time you know you're 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 working at like I say solving or addressing like major major problems um, it's tough and so like a lot of what we do is is connecting entrepreneurs and CEOs to to other people who have either been there before or in you know in the trenches with them right now to help them think through um, you know, a whole host of is issues from, um, from hiring to firing to raising capital to um, what it means to, to scale a business. And so, you know, really what we're focusing on is, is building this ecosystem, building this community of, of people like Kavish, of, of businesses like Stones to Milestones. Um, so that they're not, you know, kind of know that they're not in this to, together uh, and kind of sharing that journey a little bit as well. So, you know, we also do this in partnership um, none of this would be possible without our, our, our partners like, uh, like Pearson and Project Literacy Lab, um, you know, help bring these things together. We, we ran uh, two programs over the last year um, with, with Project Literacy, and we're also able to bring in some of their genius, uh, some of the, the heads of their organization to come and, come, to come and work with different businesses, to, to think through what it's like to, to work with a multinational with a large organization like Pearson. Uh, and Pearson can really, like, knock open doors for our entrepreneurs. You know, they, they've established connections with, with governments, with other businesses, with other, you know, suppliers and entrepreneurs around the world. And so they can pl play a, a major role in, in connecting the dots and helping, helping our entrepreneurs think through challenges that they haven't even realized they need to start thinking about yet. Um, it's a large company with thousands and thousands of people around the world. Um, so it's, it's been a real honor to work with, uh, with Jennifer and her team uh, in order to support these entrepreneurs ultimately um, you know, to, to rewrite what, um, or er eradicate the literacy. I think we're all trying to, you know, hit those, those UN SDGs of, uh, you know, this being an issue that's gone by 2030. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot of what we, we do. It's, a, it's, it's bringing together partners. It's bringing together governments, multinationals, entrepreneurs, um, to solve problems. And, you know, personally, we believe that entrepreneurs are best positioned in the world to, uh, to solve these issues. It's, um, it's guys like Kavish, like yourself, who, who see, a, see an issue like, all right, how do we get um, the entire Indian subcontinent functionally literate? Like, that's a major challenge. And those kind of challenges excite people um, so, or excite entrepreneurs. It, it, it can be a number that can also be scary for other people. It's like, oh, that is too big to even address. Um, so we're looking, at the, we're looking to support leaders who go, all right, that is an awesome problem. Um, and they get excited about problems and solving these kind of issues. Um, and so then we, we, you know, those, those type of people are few and far between. So you find that you find those kind of individuals and then you wrap as many resources around them as humanly possible in order to, to get them into the lane to, to solve and address those challenges. So um, you, you can see me getting excited just talking about it. We, we love our work. We're developing a, uh, you know, a, a community to support these uh, types of companies around the world. And um, yeah, it's, it's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, but you have, to, you have to think of challenge, you think of these problems as exciting, like it's an exciting problem to, uh, to address. Um, and business and entrepreneurs uh, get excited about solving problems. So uh, that's what we're up to. Lovely. Thank you so much, Will. As in, uh, this, this is very helpful. And I would like to, for all the participants here to know that uh, the Unreasonables program, Project Literacy Lab that we personally experienced, three things really stood out for us. Number one, 
for them to support for profit entrepreneurs because they could see the power in solving through sustainable ideas which could scale themselves over a period of time number 2 was they were picking up a group of entrepreneurs which was very diverse as in we while all 13 entrepreneurs were solving the literacy challenge but not the same challenge within literacy as you may have seen in jen's presentation within literacy there are so many perspectives and sub challenges and each of us were solving a very different set of problems there and third was the whole system process and use of technology by this accelerator program to connect the community globally called the flow system is something which was incredible as and in, i think it's it's an accelerator program and i said this to the founder of unreasonable community as well that unreasonable should run an accelerator for all the other accelerator programs in the world so <laughs> hats off to you guys incredible job uh, thank you bro from here jen uh, will we have got a flurry of questions from our participants and from our active co believers and i'm going to shoot that across to both of you and you see who would like to take them the first is you know i remember when i used to sell investments shares bonds capital no one who used to ever ask me oh kavish are you a for profit or a non profit but today when i go and say that i'm on a mission called creating a nation of readers the first question i'm asked is are you a for profit or a non profit so so the question here is how do we change the perception of the world out there that for profit ventures are not bad they can be socially ethically run with great commitment to the mission jen i can jump into that first if you have anything you want to if you add to it but um yeah i think you know it's a, it's a i think you have to zoom out um at first you know like people have a conception about money and a conception around um you know if you're doing something that impacts somebody's life you're creating value uh, you know so how whatever your concept of money is let's just zoom out on what the what the purpose of business is and the purpose of business is to solve problems and if you're solving problems you are creating value right if you're creating value i personally there's there, there's nothing wrong in the world with with making money off that right and in order to scale businesses like this um you know investors have to come in um and investors also need a return on that investment um you know and so you can even look at like non nonprofits are funded by um family foundations or corporations which are for profit entities as well uh, not always but um or yeah so it's it's just your concept of you know people have sometimes have a negative concept associated with business because of the last 150 years of you know the industrial revolution not everyone has been a part of that journey um but business also has the the ability to to transform lives and it's all about you know when we when we back a company um when we make an investment we we invest into the entrepreneur so we we invest into this this individual they are on a journey to make this happen now it's you know when you're sitting you know as an investor when you're sitting there listening to a pitch you know that this is this may work out it may not work out but you're betting on that individual to uh to essentially will this concept into reality and if 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 at their core um is a you know addressing a major societal problem or a major environmental problem you know in scaling their business you're also scaling their impact um so yeah it's 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 a it's a bit of what your concept of business is but the way in which i my concept of business is that business is there to solve problems and in solving problems you're creating value and you know money is you know is our essentially is it's essentially tangible value so uh um, this is a much larger conversation that we could host a panel on for i think multiple things but I, it's a great it's a great question i if i could just add to that and i think i think um you were you were touching on it well that it's it's the the concept is so fluid now between nonprofits and for profits and we now have b corps and benefit corporations um and i think it's becoming more understood that businesses can i think one of our entrepreneurs said this actually ira um businesses can do well by doing good um and certainly uh this was reinforced earlier this year by the world's largest asset manager blackrock ceo larry fink um he put 
public companies on notice by saying that companies must not only deliver financial performance, but they also must show a positive return to society. Um, and so, you know, and I, I think that's, that's, it's, it's no longer just about writing checks to, um, you know, good causes, your company, your company must be contributing positively to society. And I, I was at an event yesterday and um, this, this guy who supports entrepreneurs in Africa stood up and he said, if you invest in a company in Africa, you are investing in impact. Like bottom line, it doesn't matter what the company is doing. If you're investing in Africa, you're investing in impact, um, which I, I was like, huh, that's an interesting point. Um, so yeah, so I, I do think it's, um, we, we don't have distinct definitions of for-profit versus non-profit anymore. I think the world is changing. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for that perspective. And in fact, one of the things that stuck along for all social entrepreneurs that we connect with is the fact that the focus of a for-profit enterprise is to build sustainability and scalability. And uh, all the social challenges are massive in size. Without a self-sustainable, scalable idea, those challenges may never be solved through nonprofit pockets. As in, it's not a perennial source of money at the end of the day. So thank you for bringing it in. Uh, the other piece that we keep hearing is the fact that selling what people need needs so much of advertisement. Like we need soaps and detergents every day. And still there is so much of advertisement to sell a particular soap versus something else. Similarly, in social challenge where people may not be actually looking for a solution, like when we go with our reading solutions to schools and parents, they may not feel the need for it. So uh, social entrepreneurs have a big challenge to first of all create awareness with the target community about the need itself. Uh, so, so do you have any suggestions, any perspectives around based on your experience globally in solving some big challenges? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kick that off. Um, it's, you know, behavior change, I think is a key part of um, everything we do, certainly through project literacy. Um, I was talking a little bit about the Read to Kids partnership in India. And I think if, if the only thing we had done with that partnership is give people access to a library of books through their mobile phones, I don't think we would have reached 200,000 households. Um, I don't think we would have, we would have um, converted 25% of that 200,000 into frequent readers. Um, so what was super important was to also complement um, that technology with an awareness campaign, with a public education campaign, um, because the reality is there's not a, um, and India is not alone in this, but there's not a lot of attention um, for, for parents to support their children's early learning. There's a perception that that's the domain of the school, that's the domain of the educator, and that, that it's not the parent's role. Um, but actually, as we like to say in that campaign, parents are their children's first teacher. Um, so it was a big part of, of just educating people about, um, and not just educating, empowering parents. Because we find that here in the US a lot, um, especially parents who come from a low resource environment, they might not feel like they have the confidence or the knowledge or um, the tools to support their children's early learning. So it's a lot of it is education and empowerment so that you can start to shift that behavior um, to complement the, the technology. And I think that's where you really achieve scale. Yeah, perfect. And I'll, I'll add to that just a, just a hair, but you know, it's important to do things in, in partnership. Um, you know, you as, you as a, um, an individual business going in is not gonna be able to um, educate parents globally or even with an entire sector. So working in, working in partnership, you know, identifying who your allies are, um, you know, taking, taking research uh, that's been done around early childhood development um, and then working with uh, school leaders or with governments um, to help them disseminate information and then selling into those individuals who can, they can convey your message to, uh, you know, to, to the end user uh, or to the end consumer, uh, whether that's parents or children. So, you know, it's, it's all about collaborations and partnerships um, and, and building those in order to, uh, to get the message out when you don't necessarily have all of the advertising budget to, to do maybe a, uh, maybe a large scale campaign. Um, but it's taking great research, it's taking things that have already been done um, and packaging that and, and working with, with influencers, whether that's governments or uh, school boards or 
Um, it could even be social media or celebrities to help get the word out. So how, um, how can you magnify your message without uh, breaking the bank at the same time? Perfect. In fact, uh, one of the strategies that we have been using for creating a large scale awareness is using assessments and diagnostic tools for parents and school educators to see where children are in their reading abilities. And that becomes a great starting point to start a conversation saying that this is where you're expected. As Jen also mentioned in her presentation that in India, 52% children in grade five are actually reading at grade two levels. Now that's a big, big gap that we need to overcome. And as they grow in their academic learning, in Indian schools, we do see a very high dropout rates because children are not able to handle the complexity of subjects that they are taught because of these basic literacy uh, gaps that they are there. So thank you for that. Uh, on this note, uh, the other thing which is related, which uh, Will you touched upon is the partnership piece. I think uh, a lot of people in the literacy man, uh, world have a perception that partnerships come easier when you are a nonprofit versus a for-profit. Because the mo moment you are a for-profit venture, partnerships do have this whole perspective around commercials to be addressed vis-a-vis -vis nonprofits. So uh, have, you, have you come across such situations and what is your perspective around partnerships for for-profits in a social context? I can speak to that. We're, we're a for-profit organization as well. So it's, uh, we, you just do it, you know, like you're always going to have people that uh, push back on you in some, you know, one way or another, whether it's the for-profit issue, the nonprofit issue, you know, it's a whole host of reasons that people are stop, you know, trying to stop your forward progress as an entrepreneur. Um, so just don't listen to them. Just do it, right? Like just get out there and, you know, people are going to buy into the work of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, there's, there's other entrepreneurs that I know have brought in even celebrities as, in, as investors. Um, you know, um, one of our companies from the first Project Literacy uh, cohort, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is one of his investors on his table as well, and has helping magnify his message to, uh, to his community too. So you can, you can just do it. Yeah, I mean, like there's a, there's a traditional model of, of nonprofits and for-profits, and I think we're slowly kind of breaking that up and blurring those lines. Because ultimately, it's about impact. It's about solving the issue, regardless of your corporate structure. It's about addressing this major challenge that, you know, in this case, you know, there's almost a billion people out there who are functionally illiterate. So, um, you know, there's, there's nonprofit models and there's for-profit models. I'm interested in for-profit models because for-profit models, as we're seeing, have the ability to scale. I mean, like Google is not a nonprofit, right? Like they may have a nonprofit division of what they do. You know, but they have, they brought the internet um, to the world, right? Like the, the amount that they've done um, in supporting people with disabilities and, you know, improving their ability to, communi to communicate. They're for-profit business, but they've done more than maybe anyone has ever done to, uh, um, you know, give communication and voice to, uh, to some of our most vulnerable populations. So it's all about just kind of breaking up. Things are changing. I don't know that we'll be having this conversation in a decade. Um, it's just yeah. where we are right now. Yeah. yeah, I think that's true. And I would just one other point on partnerships. Um, I don't know, you can, if, if you're agnostic to for profit versus versus nonprofit, I think the question is, what does each individual partner bring to the table? Is it resources? Is it expertise? Is it networks? Like whatever that thing is, like you're pulling together and you're complementing each, complementing each other's strengths to tackle a specific challenge. So I guess I wouldn't get so hung up on the classification. It's what are you bringing to the table and what are you missing? And what partner do you need to go out and find to fill that gap? Lovely. Well, that's quite helpful. In fact, just to move on to social entrepreneurs, as in uh, most of the social entrepreneurs, when they work up their path in terms of scaling, once they've got the precise solution to solve a problem, uh, there are a lot of challenges they come across. Some of these challenges are predominantly around uh, being able to have the, attract the best talent, because somewhere we see that talent goes into sectors which are known to be high paying, and social enterprises are generally not looked at as the most uh, remunerative, most, uh, the best pay masters. Similarly, as in, do you, what's your perception about the top challenges that social entrepreneurs face? One being attracting the best talent to work for them. Yeah, I, I, I can speak to that. There is a 
million different reasons why a business doesn't work. Like creating a company, especially a company that's, um, you know, will hit that inflection curve towards scale is, is way hard. I mean, you, you encounter everything from, um, you know, hiring is obviously always a challenge, but it's, it's a challenge for um, for-profit companies with a hundred million dollars in the bank, right? Like you are, you're always competing for engineering talent. Um, the thing that social entrepreneurs have um, that I think really is, is, is a trump card is that, you know, you're giving people the ability to go to work and every day when they go to work, they are, they are impacting people's lives in a positive way, right? Like the, the code that they push, the sales phone calls that they make, you give people a purpose that's past the paycheck. Um, and I, I can't think of anything more, more important than to, uh, than to have value um, in your work. And, you know, it's part, it becomes part of your identity. Um, so people are, you, you can get more out of people, I think, too, um, you know, by having impact as core to your, your product or service and obviously part of your mission statement. Um, so, yeah, go on, Jim. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but there's, there's a host of other reasons as well. Like, it's, uh, um, yeah, growing a business and scaling a business is hard regardless of whether you're a for-profit, a non-profit, a social impact business, a traditional tech company that's creating a app that helps you crush candy faster, whatever it is, right? Like, it's, it's all hard. Um, but I think you do have a, a trump card in your back pocket of, uh, of having impact at the core of your business model. It, it attracts people to want to work with you. Yeah, I, I, I love that question because I was just reading a book called um, uh, The Power of Meaning. And it, it talks about purpose being one of the, the core pillars of meaning in our lives. That no matter what occupies our days, when we reframe our tasks, our work as opportunities to help others, our lives, our work feels much more significant. And I think the more that companies, the more that entrepreneurs can tap into that insight, um, the easier to, it will be to attract talent and certainly to retain talent. Yeah, so love that as in attracting talent by aligning them to the mission through inspiration rather than just by a single barometer of paychecks is, is what's crucially important in this case. People who are looking for meaning in their lives is, is the kind of people who will work best with social entrepreneurs. Great, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, the, the related question is, as you're scaling up as an entrepreneur, uh, do you have any guidance or any recommendation on how do they maintain a balance between scale versus impact? Because while, when I work with two kids, the kind of impact I can create is very different versus when I work with 200 million kids eventually, right? So, so uh, how, as a social entrepreneur, do you look at the balance between scale versus impact? So, Jen, if you have, I, I can try and speak to that, but that's a tough question. But uh, the, yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can speak specifically around the, the, the challenge of literacy. So my mother was a, um, she was a librarian and she taught literacy classes to, uh, to, to adults um, in the public library. And so that was my first, um, you know, kind of exposure to the illiteracy challenge, um, especially on a, an adult level. Um, another one of our entrepreneurs from the first year, his name's Brian Hill. He created a company called Adova. Um, and Brian's father taught literacy in, in Folsom Prison, so in prison system here in the United States. Um, and our, our illiteracy issues in the, in the U.S. Are, are just atrocious. You know, so Brian saw the, the individual one-off of being able to, you know, impact someone's life um, by, by teaching them to read. Um, but like an entrepreneurs are, are anxious, you know, like that one-to-one -one is, is important and you obviously get that like good feeling of working with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but like, how do you take that, you know, the, the end result of teaching someone to read and then bring it to scale? Um, so Brian is an individual to bring that back. He developed a tablet based technology that's, that's sweeping prison systems here in the United States. Um, and it solves also an issue of recidivism here. Um, you know, if someone learns to read, you know, they, they exit the prison system and they have a skill set, um, you know, where they can actually enter into a more formal economy. Otherwise, in this day and age, if you can't read or write, it's very issue, easy to go back into the underground economy, you know, into uh, what got you into prison in the first place. And so it becomes a cycle. So, you know, Brian was, you know, taking the impact that he had one on one and then built the technology to like reach that at scale. Now he's not interacting with the people and have that like warm fuzzy feeling maybe in the same way as he did as his father did when he sat down and taught someone to read. But the, the end goal uh, of, of helping people learn to read at scale is, is being addressed. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question, but it is a, it's a balance between how you feel in the one, in the one-to-one -one issue or building a technology that, uh, that, that address the issue at scale. I think there's there's also another another uh, side to that that question, which is um, I guess if you're an entrepreneur, like you know, impact is important, but how much do you focus on impact versus you know um, stabilizing the business, um, strengthening your business model, et cetera? And I was talking to the head of the collaborative fund um, recently, and I asked, I said, "Well, tell me about your impact." And he's like, "Well." Um, to be honest, right now, he's like, I focus on my, my company's um, business model strength, and I want to get them to the point where they can actually continue to, to, to work and to expand, um, and because you can't achieve impact unless you have all of the fundamentals in place. So I do think there's a bit of a tension there, um, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't support companies in his fund unless they were mission aligned. So once you establish the mission alignment, um, then you focus on business model strength um, with the, the assumption that impact will follow. So it, there is a tension there, um, but you can't achieve impact unless you have your, your house in order. Yeah, as, as social entrepreneurs, we keep exchanging these notes with our fellow entrepreneurs that it's really a tough balance. It's like a tightrope walk, which you're managing your balance between impact and scale at both times. And yeah. one of the, the so do you, do, I, I'm just thinking aloud, are there some good practices like, for instance, one solution we had in mind was having a very strong advisory board uh, with, with the balance of people with scale abilities and people with deep impact abilities was one. So similarly, are there any few recommendations? We are in the last eight minutes of this webinar. Uh, would love to invite open recommendations that Jen will, if you have for social entrepreneurs, when they are building their scale to solve literacy challenge. Yeah, don't do this by yourself. I think the advisory board is is, is huge. You know, like so you, you've obviously got your formal board, um, but even you as an individual, as as the CEO, you can create an advisory board around yourself. Uh, you can also create a you know an advisory board of you know, more of a formal advisory board for the organization of of other entrepreneurs, people you look to who have done this before, who have, you know, so identify what what it is you want your journey to be um, and identify who else is, has, you know, who do you look to as a, as a mentor um, who has done that, who has you know, scaled the business and also scaled the impact at the, uh, at the same time. And also bring in like what Jen said is Jennifer said is brilliant. Like, you know, you have to have your house in order. You have to be a resilient business in order to create impact. Like, so if the business fundamentals don't work, you will go out of business and you have no impact, you know? Um, so surround yourself with, with people who will both strengthen you as an individual, as a leader, as well as the, uh, the resiliency of your organization. Also bring in people who have scaled businesses, you know, having technologists, um, you know, that you can work with your CTO or your engineering team as kind of an advisory capacity, capacity is incredibly important because we can all get kind of focused in our, in our day to day execution. Um, but it's important to take that, that step back and both look at it of like, okay, actually, how are we doing and have third party people come in and, and be able to support that, that you trust too. So yeah, don't do this in silos, do it, um, you know, bring in people who you trust and love. And I mean, this is, this is, this is your work. This is your life's mission. So, uh, you know, bring in great people around you to support you in that journey. Yeah, and, and added to that, we were talking about it earlier, partnerships. Um, what, what partners can you bring in to help <clears throat> extend your reach, uh, scale your business in ways that are, you know, you have value flowing both ways? Um, you know, certainly as we started out on this journey, Pearson, to launch Project Literacy, you know, we're just one, we're one company, we're a big company, but we're just one company. Um, and we wouldn't be able to even begin to chip away at this challenge if we didn't do it in concert with a whole, you know, constellation of, of organizations and companies and individuals. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that, you know, partnerships do fulfill the need for scalability, but also fulfill the need for strengthening the overall social enterprise from all perspectives, not just scale itself. So partnerships can be looked at building credibility, building sustainability, building visibility and scalability. It's not just one, but all four of them put together. Lovely. So uh, I want to do a quick check with our participants and want to request if any of you uh, listening to the live webinar have a question, you can actually click on raise your hand and ask a question if you have for the panelists. 
So while uh, Jen will, while we get this uh, question thing in case we have, we'll know in the next couple of minutes, got questions flashing on the screen. Uh, one, one important question that I kind of missed bringing it up was the kind of challenges that social entrepreneurs face in a developing nation like India, Asia and Africa in general versus social entrepreneurs out there in the West. One difference we see is the nature of problem itself would be very different. But the other significant difference is the ecosystems in which we operate in terms of financing availability, government's proactiveness to adopt and support those initiatives. What has been your experience for challenges that are very specific to a developing nation like countries like Asia and Africa? Yeah, not, not, to, not to discount, but a lot of the, you know, the reason people invest into businesses, be, be it social or like a traditional business, is, is based upon, you know, the fundamentals of the organization. You're, you're investing based upon the leadership team. You're, based upon, you're investing based upon, um, you know, the numbers they're hitting, whether that's um, paid users, whether that's unpaid users. You know, people, people are putting money towards opportunity. Um, whether that's you know for profits, nonprofits, you know they they want to see um, that this organization is is impacting people's lives. Hopefully, at scale, um, and you know you get to raise more money when you get to when you're impacting more people's lives. When there's more oppor opportunity, essentially, right? Um, of uh, yeah, being able to um, yeah just kind of grow the business. So um, yeah, it's um, it's it's not not to discount it, but social entrepreneurship, traditional entrepreneurship. I think investors are looking at, um, at, at similar metrics, but you know, with social entrepreneurship, there can be uh, a bit of you know, quasi what the, what the end goal of the investor are. So is it straight impact? Is it straight returns? Yeah. Um, and it's based upon um, yeah, what the need of the individual or the uh, position of the individual you're speaking with. I, I think too, the opportunity for entrepreneurs and you know, emerging countries is to tap into kind of the corporate ecosystem as well, because big corporations like Pearson are looking for, for innovative approaches to problems that we may not be solving right now. Um, my colleague, Louisa Gokul, who's on the webinar right now, um, I just want to read a, read a quote from her. Um, she said, and sorry, Louisa, that I'm, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot here, but she said, startups are hungrier for collaboration and they add a needed perspective to the innovation scene because they're working on solutions to their own problems. Some people argue that real innovation comes for the, from the fringes of society. I think it's such an important point. And so, you know, as big corporations are looking for the next big, you know, innovation, they need to look to the ecosystems of startups in these countries in Africa and Asia. And um, because I think there's real opportunity there. Um, you know, you have to recognize that there are also constraints that the startups face in those contexts, whether it's, you know, poor access to reliable information, whether it's weak property rights, um, unstable institutions, et cetera. Um, but those startups also need mentorship. They need technical know-how, um, which is why Unreasonable is such an awesome organization because they're providing these startups with, the, with those resources. Lovely. Thank you for saying that, Jen. Yeah, the, I mean, the other... You know, an emerging economy where there's so much opportunity too. Like if you if you just think of it like that, like moving people from poverty to the middle class, right? Like by teaching them to read is inherently upward mobility. It does major societal, you know, creates major societal benefits. And moving, you know, people from the bottom of the pyramid to a little bit higher up in the pyramid is likely going to be one of the largest transference of wealth in the history of the world. So if 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 you look at it like opportunity, it's not it's not just doing something for someone who doesn't have, there is major economic benefits if you take a long-term approach to, that, to, your, to your vision as well. Lovely, and actually I have a very a real example here of the reading assessment that we launched. We launched it six months ago and we had about 25,000 children take the test and we had the audacity to commit ourselves to have 1.5 million children take the test in the next six months because the size of the problem here in India is massive. So you can imagine to take a small initiative like uh, online reading test to almost like 25,000 to 1.5 million in six months time. And that, that wouldn't have been possible as Jen said, with, without the support of corporate partnerships along with the government being involved there rather than just approaching the government by yourself. So it, it's, it's been a kind of an eye opener learning experience for us as well. 
I, I just got a couple of questions out here from the audience uh, with me. One, one is, you know, Jen, this is specific maybe for you. Uh, how do you see reading uh, in the whole gamut of literacy as in reading is a very specific uh, need? Uh, where do you place reading in the literacy chart? Oh, right. So there's the spectrum of literacies, right? Um, well, reading is, is, <clears throat> is fundamental. If you're looking at the spectrum all the way from basic literacy to digital literacy, um, you don't get to digital literacy without, without being able to, to, to read and to write. Um, so that's, you know, we, we, we talk about that as basic literacy. Um, and then when you get into functional literacy, it's, well, how do you take, you know, those, those foundational skills in reading and writing and actually apply them to the world around you? Um, and so basic literacy is a challenge, but then there's, if you look at that 750 million number, that balloons um, when you start talking about functional literacy. But um, again, you can't get to the different literacies, media, financial, um, digital literacy without that basic knowledge of, of reading and writing. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, so, uh, uh, Will, uh, there's one uh, specific question that uh, we got from Accelerator Program perspective, uh, given that I had so great things to say about Unreasonable Program. And there's a question about what are the three things that really stand out about Unreasonable's Accelerator Programs, the immersion that you have in your cohorts for 10 days, 12 days. What are the three things that stand out about your programs? Yeah, I, I, I should put it. I should push it back to you to answer that question as, as an in beneficiary of, of, of our programs. Um, I, I do think it's you know the way in which we foster community. Um, you know, it is it is really about supporting each other and building a community of support. Um, you know, our programs, ten days to fourteen days, it's really just a spark to a flame. So it's 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 getting that buy-in, and then it's really the support mechanism at, after the program. Um, you know, whether that's connecting to capital, uh, whether that's connecting to mentorship opportunities. And a lot of it's, like I said, I think I said earlier, is connecting entrepreneurs to entrepreneur. We play a lot, play kind of air traffic control. Um, you know, Kavish, you and I sh share a conversation quarterly to understand how your needs are evolving um, and what, uh, what we can do to kind of shake our network to, uh, to support those needs. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to, uh, to say. We, we, you know, we run them in beautiful places, typically away from uh, a major metropolitan area. So everyone is living and working and creating together. Um, they're not jumping out to um, take meetings in New York or Mumbai. Um, so you're, you're kind of out there beside each other and, and actually stepping outside of your business day to day um, um, and working kind of in the business or on the business. Um, the, the other bit is we also work with companies that are a little bit further along. So we work with companies that have, you know, an established track record to some degree. You know, they have customers, they've been validated by the market through investment. So we're a little bit later stage. And so in the entire like accelerator ecosystem, um, we don't focus as, as heavily on the earlier idea stage companies. We're working on companies that are really either poised to scale or are already in the process of scaling. Um, so you're bringing together leaders who are in that kind of trajectory um, rather than trying to figure out what their idea or business model might be. Lovely. So there's this one interesting conversation which is happening in parallel as we are talking on this webinar is about teachers turning into social entrepreneurs. Uh, so I, I think uh, as I've experienced at Project Literacy Lab as well, there were quite a few people or fellow entrepreneurs who were actually teachers who turned into social entrepreneurs. And there are two questions here, uh, Bill and Jen, whoever wish to take it. One, what is the gap or what is preventing a teacher to turn into a social entrepreneur? As in, is it just the courage to become a social entrepreneur or is it something else that you see? And, and second is, uh, are teachers better social entrepreneurs or a, tech, a technologist, a techie, a better social entrepreneur? So a bit controversial, but yes, we'd love to hear your opinion on that. Take it away, Will. I think we could just we could keep coming back to partnerships every single time. So you could have a teacher and a technologist, um, and someone who worked within a you know large multinational like Pearson or whatever it might be, right? Like you know it's it's creating that co-founder dynamic. Um, you don't have to have all the skill sets at the same time. Um, you know it's it's doing it in concert with others. As a teacher, you're exposed to new ideas or new ways of training. Um, you know we've one of um, our um, 
I shouldn't say my favorite, but there's so many great entrepreneurs we work with. Eileen Murphy, I think, think Circa, um, was from our first uh, Project Literacy um, cohort of entrepreneurs. She was a teacher and then a school board administrator um, and developed a technology that she found that was really helping you know, accelerate the, uh, um, you know, kids that she was working with. So yeah, I mean, she came out and then she worked with other engineers and the funding ecosystem of Chicago and ultimately figured out how to build this company and uh, has been on a you know, skyrocketing trajectory ever since. So yeah, we can keep coming back to partnerships. Don't, don't do this in silos. Um, and, and just um, one thing to add to that, um, and I was shocked when I, when I learned this, but um, uh, almost 40% of Pearson's employees are former teachers or former school administrators. Mm. Um, and so, you know, can teachers, can teachers run businesses? Can teachers be entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Lovely. And, and just to address the first part of the question, what do you think is the gap between a teacher turning into a social entrepreneur? What would actually nudge them just to jump the fence? Entrepreneurship's not for everyone. So like, I mean, it's, it's hard, right? Like you're stepping outside of a, um, a comfortable living arrangement, whatever that might be as a, as a teacher or any other sort of profession. Um, and so to step into the unknown takes, takes courage. Um, and so you've really, you've got to, like the issue that you're solving, um, it has to resonate in your soul, right? Like it has, to, it has to wake you up in the middle of the night. It has to be the thing you're thinking about when you, when you wake up in the morning um, because it is hard and there's a high success, you know, there's a high probability that you will fail in this, in this venture in the first place, like in even getting it off the ground. Um, so you've got to really believe in the problem um, and um, be willing to, uh, to adapt your tool to, to solve that problem. But it's, uh, yeah, it's not easy. It's a tough journey. Okay. You want to add anything to that, Jen? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think it's probably um, not not unique to teachers, right? What what does it take for anyone to to make that jump, right, and to to take that that risk? Um, and to Will's earlier point, um, you know, don't do it alone. <laughs> it's uh, you know, it 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 has so many embedded challenges that to be able to to um, do that in partnership with with someone else or or um, you know other people um, can can make that journey probably less lonely and and a little bit easier. Good. And our reading our reading first webinars are not over unless we get some recommendations to read from our panelists. So uh, huh. what, what's one book, or not even a book, let's say anything that you would love our social entrepreneurs who are listening to it right now or in future to read or look up for? I, I did wrote uh, that book you mentioned, The Power of Meaning, and yeah. I'm looking up for that for sure. I, I can tell you what I'm reading right now. Uh, I haven't developed my full summer reading list yet, but I'm, I'm reading a book called uh, Leadership on the Line. Um, it's by Ronald uh, Heifetz. He's a uh, professor at uh, Harvard's Kennedy School. Um, and so it's, it's all about adaptive leadership. So, and I think it's important for entrepreneurs because it's, it's not all technical problems that we're solving. So much of it is, is leadership challenges. And how do you rally people around a concept and how do you get buy-in? Um, and how do you ultimately like solve the challenges that you're working so on? So, um, Ronnie is the uh, kind of foremost thinker around adaptive leadership. Um, and I'm, I'm reading his book for a second time right now. It's called Leadership on the Line. So I'm just pulling out my books that are on my desk right now. Um, one that's not on my desk, but I highly recommend is Marlon Bundo. It's a children's book. <laughs> Thank you, Julia Firestone, for recommending it. <laughs> Look it up. I will say no more. Um, how to find the work you love, short and sweet. Um, I think, you know, relevant to what we were talking about today. And then no ordinary disruption, um, all about, uh, you know, the, the digital disruption that's knocking almost every industry sideways. I think a really important because um, so many entrepreneurs are actually taking advantage of that disruption. Um, so that too is a good book. So here's a My, quick poll uh, for, sorry, Bill, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, one of the books that was seminal in my own life was a, uh, a book called Made the Stick um, as well. It's by Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, Chip is a regular mentor in our programs. Um, but it's about how to get your ideas to resonate with people, which is core to starting any business or any movement. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd recommend that as well, Made the Stick. Great, so I just looked up at the clock and it's 7.40 here in India. 
Uh, I know the families are waiting for the people on the webinar to join them for dinner. And I want to express my massive thanks to both of you to wake up so early and be ready up here for a wonderful webinar with all of us. Jen and Will, thank you so, so much for making it happen for us. Thank you, Kavish. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much, Kavish. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.